that you love us and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this world, that you love us and transform people like us through the power of your son and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would be our guide today as we look into your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our lives and in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was 40 weeks ago today that we began our journey through uh, the Bible, and we have for 40 weeks been in the Old Testament, and then over those 40 weeks, we have learned an awful lot about the Lord, and like Kara alluded to earlier, uh, we have been in a period of waiting for Messiah. We've been waiting for the part of the story where Jesus comes. In these 40 weeks, we've read about God who has eternally existed as he spoke the world into existence, creating light and darkness, creating galaxies and atoms, plants and animals and human beings. We read as Adam and Eve, the first human beings to ever live, rebelled against God, made a choice that if they hadn't made, I guarantee you one of us probably would have made and fell short of God's glory. And in Genesis chapter 3, we read about the fact that because of their sin, God judged Adam and Eve and the serpent Satan. And in that judgment also provided some hope for all of us. And in judging them said, but I will send a Messiah. He will be a savior. He will be my son. And um, as I've read the Old Testament over this past year, I have found myself just craving the Messiah. I found myself at a spot where as I read how one generation after another since how it took just one generation of, of people for brother to murder brother, I have found myself desiring the hope that comes from Jesus. As I read about godly men and women who did incredibly stupid and shameful things, I found myself craving the one who will never fail us. The Jewish people had a special place in the heart of God. They were his chosen people. The Old Testament tells the story of their covenant relationship with God in which the Lord shows his mercy and his judgment over and over again to a disobedient people who from time to time would repent. As Old Testament history closes, it looks like God has finally worked again on behalf of the children of Israel. There was this little faithful remnant who had remained in Jerusalem for all of the years of captivity in Babylon and Assyria. And this little faithful remnant is visited by some who were in the captivity who build walls around the city. A second temple is built. And uh, as the Old Testament closes... And we move into this period of silence between the Testaments. The Jewish people are at a spot of just finally getting their footing back. And then the period between Malachi and the New Testament occurs. And the Bible is generally silent about what happens during those 400 years between the Testaments. We know that for the Jewish people, Judaism had become a religion that was practiced in the city of Jerusalem And the people uh, practiced this religion with a faithfulness and a steady heart, but in many ways missed out on what the heart of God was all about. The people of Israel were still awaiting their Messiah. They were still living largely under the control of foreign governments too. Yeah, they may not have been in captivity in a foreign land, but there's a new superpower in the world as the New Testament opens. And it's the most powerful superpower that the nations had ever experienced. The Roman Empire was in full swing as the New Testament opens. And the Roman Empire was unlike the Egyptian or the Babylonian or the Assyrian empires. This was an empire that had advancements in technology like the world had never seen. The Romans brought roads into uh, the, the infrastructures of the cities. And the Roman roads were famous for uh, transforming transportation in the world. The Roman aqueducts were, were, were famous for transforming the way that agriculture was grown and, uh, and bringing water to the citizens. Not only were, these tech, were there technologies there, there were intellectual advancements as well. And the Romans and the Greeks worked together to bring about this kind of new world order when it came to how people thought about things and how people were educated. The Roman army and Roman diplomacy were changing into cultural, political, religious, and educational systems. And the Jewish people felt marginalized and desperately sought to hear from God. 
For 400 years, it seemed as if God was silent between the Testaments. This God who had worked so mightily, who had spoken through the prophets, who had spoken through the kings, who had spoken verbally himself, there was just nothing. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we read about what happened. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the, with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. <clears throat> Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So begins the Apostle John's account of this man named Jesus. And it's not surprising that as we begin our New Testament reading through the challenge in a chronological way, that those who put together the chronological reading plan would say, hey, we're going to begin with John chapter 1. Because John begins with eternity past to help us understand who it is that Jesus Christ was. There's something spectacular about John 1, 1 through 18. If you were a member of the early church, you would have known these verses. They would have been intimately, uh, you would have been intimately acquainted with them because they would have been one of your favorite worship songs. John 1, 1 through 18 was a song of worship, a song that the early church sang to essentially answer the question, So who is Jesus? Who is this man? And that was the question that was being asked in the first century more than any other question. People wanted to know, who is Jesus? Who is this guy? And that's a question that many throughout the ages have asked. In fact, I hope every one of you here have asked that question, that you've at least wrestled with the issues of who is it that Jesus really is. Is he who he said he was? Is he who the disciples said that he was? Or or is he someone else? Let me tell you what some famous people throughout the ages have said when um, they have been asked, who is Jesus? Larry King, the CNN talk show host, was once asked who he would most want to interview and if if he could choose to interview anyone from history. And he said without blinking, Jesus Christ. And then the questioner asked, well, and what would you like to ask him? And King replied, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. The answer to that question would define history for me. H.G. Wells famously said, I am a historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. Napoleon said the following of Jesus Christ, I know men and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Napoleon was absolutely blown away at the fact that Jesus Christ could transform the world, not by force, but by love. Gandhi said, a man who was completely innocent offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. And it was Albert Einstein who said, as a child, I received instruction in both the Bible and in the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. 
Albert Einstein said that about Jesus Christ. I mean, that blows me away. All right, one more. Daniel Webster, the great statesman, once said, if I might comprehend Jesus Christ, I could not believe on him. He would be no greater than myself. Such is my consciousness of sin and inability that I must have a superhuman Savior. He is so unfathomable is how Daniel Webster felt. See, that's the Savior that's described in John's first chapter. That is the description that the Apostle gives us of the one who changed the course of human history. The Apostle answers the question, who is this man? Who is Jesus Christ? Right off the bat in verse 1 of John chapter 1, by showing us that Jesus Christ is the eternally preexistent God. And he does it with the words, in the beginning was the word. There has never been a time in the history of the world that Jesus Christ did not exist. That is an awesome and a mind-boggling thought. Now, I'm one of those people who became a Christian as a child. I was four years old when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And you know, one of the things that I remember about growing up is that one of the first things that I struggled with in my newfound faith was how Jesus Christ could have eternally existed. I mean, this whole idea of eternity boggled my mind then, and it boggles my mind now. I mean, how in the world is there a God who has eternally existed, that there is no beginning, and how in the world is it that there will be no end? But we know that this is true of Jesus Christ. It is who he has said that he is. And it is one of the toughest things to to wrestle with. Now that I'm a pastor, I have it all figured out. So, you know, come see me afterwards and I'll tell you how that works. No, it is is incredibly mind-boggling when we wrestle with this issue of eternity. But it's one of the, it is the first description that John gives us of Jesus. Jesus is the eternally preexistent God. Verse 1 also shows us that Jesus has been eternally in relationship with the words, and the word was with God. Multiple times I have preached messages here on the importance of community. The fact that God has created every one of us with a need to interact with other human beings. And I've talked about the importance of small groups and the importance of walking through this life with a band of brothers or sisters who will walk with you and pray with you and support you and be there with you. And I don't care how much of an introvert you are, you need people who will walk through this life with you. I'm an introvert, but I need people in my life who I know are going to love me, who are going to pray for me, who are going to be there for me when I need them. I want to know, even as an introvert, that there are people who care deeply about me. And you can't tell me that you don't have that need. You can't tell me that there's not a longing within you to have one or two or three or more people in your life who care about you and know you deeply and love you for who you are. And see, that's a desire that comes because we were created in the image of a God who has existed eternally in relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 1 also teaches us a third lesson. And it shows us that Jesus is eternally God. And the Word was God. John Mix minces no words from the very beginning of his gospel. He says, listen, this Jesus who I'm going to talk to you about throughout this gospel is none other than God. Kent Hughes writes, the simple sequence of verse 1 is the most compact and pulsating theological statement in all of Scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Which brought about a second crisis of my faith growing up. Because when I read John chapter 1 growing up, I thought, why didn't John make it simple? And just say, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And I mean, why did he use this word, Word? This makes no sense to me. And in the Old Testament is where we find the answer. We've read the Old Testament this year, you know, over 1,500 times in the Old Testament. The Word of God is used. The, the, that phrase, the Word of God, the Word is, is, is powerful. And John used a term that the early church and the, the people in Jerusalem and the Jewish culture would have understood that Messiah was going to be the fulfillment of the law, that he, he was literally the embodiment of the word. 
John used a word that we struggle with, but that those in the first century wouldn't have struggled with at all to understand that this is Jesus we're talking about. All right, John also shows us that Jesus is eternally creator. Verse 3 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Just like the book of Genesis begins in the beginning, (laughs) God created the heavens and the earth, John begins this book in the beginning and then begins to spell out for us who this Jesus is. And he talks about already in verse 3 that Jesus Christ was present at creation and he is actually creator God. Nothing in the entire universe was made that doesn't have the fingerprints of Jesus Christ. No plant, no animal, no star, no galaxy, not you, not me. We've all been created by Jesus. He has been part of that process. Jesus is creator God. Kent Hughes writes that Einstein believed that we have scanned with our largest telescopes only one billionth of theoretical space. Let me help you understand our creator a little bit more through this. He says, this means that there are probably something like 10 octillion stars in space. How many is that? Well, a thousand thousands make a million. Some of you have heard this before. A million millions, a thousand millions make a billion. A thousand billions make a trillion. A thousand trillions make a quadrillion. A thousand quadrillions make a quintillion. A thousand quintillions make a sextillion. A thousand sextillion makes a septillion. A thousand septillions equals an octillion. So 10 octillion is 10 with 27 zeros behind it. And Jesus Christ created it all. But that was what Einstein thought. Since Einstein's days, we've actually found out that there are a lot more stars than that. Not only is is he creator of the macrocosm of the universe, but he is the creator of the microcosm of the inner universe of the atom. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ is our creator God. And that is awesome. We only hit three verses in John chapter 1. And he's already throwing all these descriptions about God. Listen, you read the entire gospel of John, and John's going to give you over 150 different names for who Jesus was. And by the end of the book of John, John says, listen, I'd love to tell you more about Jesus. In fact, I'm going to tell you more about Jesus because I'm going to write 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Okay, he doesn't say that. And I'm going to write the book of Revelation through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But here's the deal. John says, even if I wrote everything I could possibly write about Jesus Christ in his book, he says, all the books and all the libraries and all the earth couldn't contain the knowledge that there is of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our eternal creator. Verses 4 and 5 teach us that Jesus is eternally life, and he is the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. One of the things that I love about the Gideons is that the Gideons bring light oftentimes to very dark places. Listen, some of you may say, well, is what the Gideons do important? Yeah. Bringing the word of God to people who have never read the word, there is testimony after testimony after testimony about the way that God's word transforms lives, about the way that people are changed because of the reading of this word. Some of you have been following along with us in the challenge all all year long, and you've been reading the Bible, and you're telling me, Brian, God's changing me. I talked to somebody after the first service who said, you know when you said that you couldn't wait for the Messiah to come, like the New Testament to start? He says, I'm with you. I've been reading the Old Testament all year, and I'm beginning to understand how much that longing for Messiah must have been in the hearts of the Jewish people. And he says, and I look at our world today, and I'm longing for God more than ever. When we read God's word, our lives change. Max Lucado tells this great modern-day parable about a people who live in a dark and a cold cave. The cave dwellers would huddle together, and they'd cry against the chill. Long and loud, they they wailed. It was all that they did. It was all that they knew what to do. The sounds in the cave were mournful, but the people didn't know it, for they had known no joy. The spirit of the cave was death, but the people didn't know it, for they had never known life. But one day they heard a different voice. I have heard your cries, it announced. I have felt your chill, and I've seen your darkness, and I've come to help you. The cave people grew quiet. They'd never heard this voice. Hope sounded strange to their ears. How can we know that you've come to help? Trust me, he answered. I have what you need. 
The cave people peered through the darkness at the figure of the stranger. He was stacking something and then stooping and stacking more. What are you doing? One cried nervously. The stranger didn't answer. What are you making? Another shouted even louder. There was still no response. Tell us, demanded a third. The visitor stopped and spoke in the direction of the voices. I have what you need. And with that, he turned to the pile at his feet and he lit it. And wood ignited and flames erupted and light filled the cavern. And the people turned away in fear. Put it out, they cried. It hurts our eyes to see it. The light always helps. It hurts before it helps, he answered. Step closer, the pain will soon pass. Not I, declared a voice. Nor I, declared a second. Only a fool would risk exposing his eyes to such light, said another. The stranger stood next to the fire. Would you prefer the darkness? Would you prefer the cold? Don't consult your fears. Take a step of faith. For a long time, no one spoke. The people hovered in groups, covering their eyes. The fire builder stood next to the fire. It's warm here, he invited. He's right, one from behind him announced. It is warmer. The stranger turned to see a figure slowly stepping toward the fire. I can open my eyes now, she proclaimed. I can see. Come closer, invited the fire builder, and she did. She stepped into the ring of light. It's so warm. She extended her hands and sighed as her chill began to pass. Come, everyone, feel the warmth, she invited. Silence, woman, cried one of the cave dwellers. Dare you lead us into your folly? Leave us, leave us and take your light with you. She turned to the stranger. Why, why won't they come? They choose the chill, for though it's cold, it's what they know. They'd rather be cold than to change. And live in the dark, she asked. And live in the dark, he replied. In verses 6 to 14 of John, the chapter continues to show us that Jesus really is the eternal life and light of the world. He's the great God and we need him. Listen, as a church, we're going to discover over these next three months of the challenge some wonderful things about Jesus. As we go through the New Testament, we're going to find out that this is truly a God that we will never be able to learn everything about. Scripture is the story of Jesus. And as the New Testament opens, our hero has arrived. In every chapter, Jesus is revealed further, and that is awesome. My prayer is that we will discover just who this man is. For the majority of those living in the first century, the response to Jesus was one of either ignorant, to, to be ignored, or to be rejected. Verses 10 and 11 tells, tell us that he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Remember, the first century Jews had a religion that they were very comfortable in, but had largely missed out on the heart of God. Most of them missed out that Jesus was the Messiah. The majority of folks living today have rejected Christ too, but we have a choice. Look at verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who received them, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Three key words are given to us in verse 12, and Pastor Brian Bill wrote it better than I could have, and I want to read what he says. Received is the first key word. It's an active word with a deep meaning. It literally means to take or to seize. Those who receive Christ are those who welcome him and accept him into their lives. Jesus is typically thought of as God's gift at Christmas. We can choose to ignore him or reject him, or we can take what has been freely offered to us. Have you taken hold of him? Have you received him into your life? Believed is the second word. To believe means to encourage our total being so that we put our trust completely in Christ by committing our lives to him. It involves more than just an intellectual assent or an emotional response. Biblical belief always involves receiving or responding to God and what Christ has done for us. The third word is right. This word means honor or privilege. The moment that you receive Christ into your life, God gives you the honor of becoming a member of his family. We're given permission to become a child of God when we believe and receive. Believe, receive, and become. We must first believe that Jesus is the only way to a relationship with God, the Father. 
then we must actually receive what God has done for us by personally ap- 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 appropriating the gift of salvation. And then we become children of God. Verse 13 makes it clear that salvation doesn't run automatically from one generation to another. In the words of Charles Spurgeon, you will never get to heaven in a crowd. It's true that there will be crowds in heaven, but we only get there one at a time. God saves individuals, not masses or groups. The whole gospel is in the little phrase, born of God. Salvation is of the Lord. It's a free gift, both totally free and totally of grace. It is not a cooperative venture where you do your part and God does his. We may ask, don't I have a part to play in salvation? We do indeed have a part. Our part is to be hopelessly lost in sin, and God's part is to save us. That way God alone gets the credit. Salvation is a work of God from first to last and is wrapped in the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So who can do that? Verse 14 makes it clear, Jesus can, because he was simply God incarnate. He was God in the flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Perhaps the greatest description that I have heard from a modern day pastor on who Jesus Christ is, the greatest answer to, so who is this man? was from an African-American pastor who pastored in Los Angeles, whose mother gave him the unfortunate name of Dr. Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. Okay, he didn't get the doctor part, but the Shadrach Meshach came from his his mother. She must not have been a fan of a Bendigo. But um, he pastored Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego from 1953 to 93 and died in the year 2000. Some of you have heard this uh, video before, but I felt it appropriate to end this time with today. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. 
He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing to our king. Sing to the king who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus the 